welcome. Amen. It's loaded now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Saturday edition of A Quiet Time. With the Superhero Ministry on the Gaming for Christ Network. Wow, that's a big deal. Today, we are going to focus on a new study, Book 1, Chapter 4. That's right. We are still studying out Peter Chronicles. I hope you guys have been studying along with me that we're gaining the information, the understanding that God intends for us to gain an understanding. Hopefully, as we continue, we will grow in that understanding. We see to the right here, the newspaper article, the good news. We know that it is the good news because it is the truth. And the truth is the good news. You'd rather be in the know than to not be in the know. And we know that the fall of mankind with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that deception crept into our world. It's been passed down through DNA. So anytime we can get the opportunity to seek the truth when we seek it with all of our hearts, then we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. And that's good news. We will be freed from deception, which means we will be freed from the deceptive door. And that is a big deal. It's the difference between being blessed versus being cursed. So we're going to go ahead and get deep into the study. Peter Chronicles, book one, chapter four. Breaking news. Amen. As we do each week, we go into our mission statement, which is we are a group of people desiring to draw closer to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ through Christ Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we see my man here on the photograph with his bicycle. He all dressed up, learning how to be a little businessman. He has a paper route. I don't know about you guys, but back in the day, I had a paper route. Friends of mine had paper routes. That was the way we could earn our little bread in the neighborhood and people appreciate it. And so the good news, like we delivered it as kids, it's being delivered to us. It is a paper route. That is a big deal. All right. So we are a group of people desiring to draw closer to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's understanding that through the spirit, the concept of being a parent, the concept of being a child was actually created before we ever came about. That idea of parenting, that idea of father and child, that concept comes from the almighty. And you got a lot of people looking at themselves as parents today, and then they don't look at God and what he established. And in many instances act as if mankind came up with the concept of its own so that when Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees and the people of Israel back in the day, he started talking about God being his father. People thought he lost his mind and acting like basically mankind came up with the concept itself where we were made in God's image. And so Jesus Christ is trying to bring us back to the original reality but people were far gone already by then. And that was 2000 years ago. And you still have people today not understand that the concept of parenting father child relationship is actually created by God himself. He is our parent. He is not only Christ parent, he's ours too. That makes us brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ and co-heirs. We've studied that stuff before, but in this case, we can't draw closer to the Father, but through Jesus Christ, and that constitute the reality that mankind fell. And because we fell, we needed a high priest, a priest that can bring us back into relationship with God. He went into the most holy room 
one time instead of over and over again. So the more you study, the more you learn about the truth, the more you understand the common sense of its reality. And so we got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to get it. These are spiritual truths written in spiritual words. They're all the word of God. That's why all scripture is God breathed and he breathed into our nostrils, the breath of life. So we come from that word so that when we read his word, we should be reading the reality of who we are. Christ did that. And he was put on the cross because he did that because people had fallen so far away that even people that claim to be in association with God, in relationship with God, created by God, etc., made sure that they kept distance from God and didn't understand that the word of God has to be talking about us too. All this should make more and more sense as we study more and more and the objective is to become one and that takes digging in and understanding the reality of the spiritual realm and therein lies our mission statement Amen. and drawing closer each week we focus on a passage of scripture and again today we're going to go into book one, chapter four. And so we're going to start it out with first Peter chapter four and verses one through three in the NIV and it's titled living for God. Right. And we see my man over here. So he's in the new age. We saw the last picture where my man was over there with a paper wrap. And now you see my man here and he's looking into the computer. However, you need to get the good news, whether you get it by paper and you're reading the word of God through the book itself, where a lot of people say, I just like to turn the pages. I like to feel the pages in my hand. I like to see the words on the paper that does more for me than seeing it on the computer. And other people go, well, I need to see the words on the computer. I'm more tech. That's more who I am. That does more for me than seeing it on the paper. And of course, back in the day, it was in a scroll without chapter and verses, right? So the bottom line is it's the word, whatever float your boat. But this particular character here, he's looking at it via the computer. Either way is constituted as good news. And so in that good news, he says, living for God. Before I even start here, let me tell you, that title is a big deal. And people go, well, that's not a big deal. Living for God, you know, everybody that goes to church every week, that's what we're trying to do. And Rodney, that's what it's all about, living for God. But it's a big deal. And if it's not a big deal, then the understanding of how big of a deal it is, isn't apparent in the heart. So I'm going to try to attempt to make it apparent right now as best as I can in a short amount of time because we're not digging in right now. But in the beginning, mankind fell, right? We know that in Genesis chapter three. And so God kicked mankind, that means Adam and Eve out of the garden. He put cherubim to protect the way so they couldn't get back in there. So now they're exited out of the garden and now things are gonna be harder for them. Well, at that point, the relationship with God was going to have issues because now the knowledge of good and evil is into the mix. And so the mindset has shifted after that. And there's fallen mankind where sin and all that temptation is all in the mix. And so when he says living for God, that means that the door had been opened up, that Jesus Christ opened up that opportunity so that we could be back to living for God, back to living in that relationship. Well, you can't just look at this title and go living for God without understanding there is the concept of fallen mankind and there's the concept of Jesus Christ going into the most holy room to open the door for us, to give us that access, give us that opportunity. So living for God, is a big deal because if God did not give us the grace and mercy, right? We know that Jesus Christ's grace and mercy comes through him and by him in his presence. And so with that being said, that grace and mercy means that we can live for God. Without that, God could have said, hey, you guys blew it. That's it. Let me get rid of you. 
He didn't have to bring Noah forward and save those eight people by giving Noah the vision to build the ark, etc. So he's constantly through prophets, through Jesus Christ himself and through the apostles thereafter, and then people that he bring on board and call today to help us out, etc. that all of that is God's grace, giving people the opportunity to live for God. So I just want to get that clear before I start that living for God is not like some just small concept. It's like, that's everything. That's a really big deal. Having that opportunity is God's grace and mercy. That's a real big deal. All right. So verse one, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. But you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Yeah, we've read this before, but now we're reading it in the context of this series. And so we know chapters one, two, and three talked about different types of suffering where being a slave and women being subject to man. And what if the guy is not a believer? And then what if the woman is not a believer? And then learn it from your own husbands at home and all this stuff that deals with imperfect mankind, yet God is laying out order where there's chaos. And so that takes effort and that means there's going to be conflict and that's not an easy thing to accomplish what being laid out for us here and so when he says living for god again remember i said in the outset here that's a big deal well the fact of what we all talked about as it relates to the fall of man in the garden but also the fact that living for God is a challenge because there's challenging spirits on the other side of that that are trying to make that not happen. So living for God is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And so that's why he says, therefore, right? In relation to all those other things that he wanted people to do. And we last looked at the last chapter where he's talked a lot about the women. He's going to everybody now, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body. And so that's in context with what we said that there's nothing that God calls us to do that Christ did not do. So since Christ suffered in his body, we have to arm ourselves. So there's people taking up arms. There's people that are taking up arms. They go by the second amendment. There's people taking up arms in war, etc. And so just like those situations, this too is a war. And that's the war against our souls. We talked about that week one and week two. And so arming ourselves is a form of arming. So we got to arm ourselves, but we have to arm ourselves with the same attitude. So that's a mindset. So God is going, arming yourselves is gearing up your mentality. And that means that the battle is of the mind. And so that our mentality is what's being attacked. And so that is why it's so important to know the truth because deception does something to the brain to believe in something that is not real and to constitute it as real will have your mind focused on things that's not reality that can also lead to a bunch of emotion about something that's not even true. So you got to arm yourself with the same attitude that's arming because, because the reason whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. So now we know that the mindset says suffering in the body has to go through a process. That's a different mindset because the a mindset we had prior would be, I don't want no pain. Now we've heard of that concept when we work out says no pain, no gain, but Christ suffered in his body. 
And then when he gave up the ghost, he said, it is finished. He was done with the whole body concept. Then he resurrected from the dead, came back, and there was nothing you were gonna be able to do to his body thereafter. He did that just to show us there's continued life beyond the grave. So with that mindset, we arm ourselves with the mindset that regardless of the flesh concept, there's life that exists beyond the grave, beyond the body. And so we arm ourselves that living in the body isn't all that. It isn't everything. And there's people trying to max out their game in the body. Okay, that's one thing. But to put no type of max out effort into the spiritual realm. So God is going whatever it takes for him to get us to the proper mindset. We're like this kid here being focused in this computer. We need to be focused on the reality of the spiritual realm. Verse two, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires. So he's talking about while still being alive in the body. So that suffering in the body is also creating a focus or should be creating a focus that at some point, I will not have to be going through this stuff anymore. So there's the concept of perseverance. So the concept of perseverance is attached to the title living for God. That's why we said it's not easy. So having that mindset while we go through the stuff that we go through, in the body because of fallen mankind we go through different things illnesses etc various forms of pains in the body he's going okay at some point we will overcome that that will not be an issue forever but the spirit will live forever so there again is that persevering concept verse 3 says for you have spent enough time the word time so at some point, your mindset has to say, enough. Jesus Christ on the cross said, it is finished, enough. I'm done with doing what I had to do. And so before he gave up the ghost and laid his head to rest, he said, it is finished, it is enough. So he knew when he reached that threshold, that the curse was all subsided in his body. And at that point he could go. All right, so you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. So he's going at some point, we gotta say it is enough. At some point we gotta go, I'm dying to that. I've had enough with going through what I'm going through. I've had enough with using my body for sin. I've had enough of being engaged in that. Enough is enough. I've had enough of what he says, living in debauchery. I've had enough of debauchery. I don't need any more. Don't give me any more. Now there's some people more spiritual than others that then caught that drift along time ago and there's others that went ahead and did it like Solomon where they've had everything and now they're at the point where well there's nothing else I can buy there's nothing else I can achieve I'm done get me out of this place I know some friends of mine that have been in the entertainment industry and I'm not on you know down on the entertainment I'm just saying I've had some friends that are in the entertainment industry that said I've had enough I, they didn't even want to live anymore. So living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. It's like at some point you go, I, that, enough, because it's all immature stuff. So believe it or not, you got old folks still want to do this stuff. They want to continue to do this stuff all the way to their grave. God is going, man, at what point are you going to say enough is enough? Let me live for God. I am tired of living for sin. And therein lies our drawing closer portion of today's study. Amen. Hallelujah. 
each week and focusing on that opening prayer, we see here on the photograph a letter. So we've seen the paper route, my man delivering the good news by newspaper. We've seen the youngster go on the computer and he's getting his good news from a computer, a program. And here we see a letter. He had the letter come in the mail. So however God needs to get you the good news is how he needs to get you the good news. You need to be fired up and excited about however you can get the good news. You might have a preference, but hey, however you can get the good news, you need to be all fired up about it. So you know how we do it. Before we do our opening prayer, we'd like to go ahead and continue to dig in scripture. We are on book one, chapter four. So we're going to continue in first Peter chapter four. And here we're going to look at verses four through six in the NIV. And it says they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. So we've talked about this particular passage before. We'll talk about it again now. We will talk about it again in the future, if God willing. But they're going to be surprised that you don't join them in their reckless, wild living because you had enough. They haven't had enough. You know, greedy people, lustful people, like, give me more, give me more, give me more. So they're like, what? You're done already? I'm done. I'm tired of living like that. I need to live for God. And so when they hear that, they're surprised because you used to roll with them. And so they heap abuse on you. You might not know they're heaping abuse on you. We talked about that last week, how there's people with thoughts about you, saying things about you, speaking about you into the atmosphere and as a result of talking even if they're talking to somebody else or they're thinking the thought to themselves those dark arrows start coming your way and you might not be aware so they heap abuse on you where you might not even know but people take this passage and say well nobody's heaping abuse on me yeah people know i stopped rolling with them and i'm a christian and they really don't have anything you know, to say in my face, that's in your face. But you don't know what haters are out there. And spiritually, there's that game that's now coming after you, towards you, because it's energy. It takes energy to have these thoughts. It takes energy to say these words. And so as a result of all that, that energy is in motion. Energy is not stagnant. And so it's directed towards where you direct it to. You start thinking about a person, that's energy being directed toward that person. You start thinking about a situation, that's energy now directed toward that situation. So we gotta be careful of where we project that energy. Verse five says, but they will have to give a count to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So this scripture says, Jesus Christ is ready. He's the judge. God handed over the judgment to the son. So God is ready. So then what's the problem? If God is ready and Christ is ready, then that means the people that they are targeting, they're not ready. The people who have decided they're going this way they're not ready. So in the real time, right? In the timeline, you know, outside the timeline, it already went down, but we're living inside the timeline. So inside the timeline, there is that readiness that we are going through. They are already ready. So we need to speed the situation by showing the Lord that we're ready to roll because there's many of us who have been called and chosen that will be on the team that are still figuring out one foot in, one foot out. Now, there's many of us that went one foot out and going completely out. And there's many of us going one foot in that's going to go completely in. 
God is waiting for those that are going to go completely in. Now we saw it last week where he talked about Noah and the ark. And so with Noah and the ark, he said only eight people were saved because Noah listened to what God was saying. And that was the concept of the symbol of baptism, right? Okay, well, look at it here. Look at those other seven. Had they said, well, I got one foot in and one foot out. It wasn't going to work. If they would have continued with one foot in and one foot out of the ark, the ark would have sunk. So as a result, you best believe that if they weren't ready to come in when it was time to shut that door, a wind or God would have had Noah push them, but they would have got, they would have been outside. They wouldn't have got in. So you got to go in when the door is ready to close. He's already ready to close the door. So when people start acting like everything's a long way off, well, this verse five should tell them, actually, he's ready to roll at any moment. Verse six says, well, this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead. So this gospel about God is ready, is already being preached to even those people who are dead, who are in waiting, and they're even going, hey, let's get this show on the road. And it says, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body. In other words, what did you do in the body? And that human standard we talked about it before is Jesus Christ is perfection. So that God gave us a countermeasure because we're not perfect and the standard is perfection. So Jesus took on our sins so that we can receive grace. And that grace is what we got to have faith in. And so that faith is the human standard right if you go and read hebrews 11 you're going to see those individuals who are in various types of situations even like rahab prostitute where faith was being used as the human standard so faith means though that you're going to have to act on the truth obedience is still the issue Faith doesn't mean, oh, well, I believe that I can run around here and still be in debauchery, lustfulness, drunkenness, and all that kind of stuff. No, it means that you got to be moving forward in that relationship with God, drawing closer to him. That means we're digging in with our, all of our hearts. But he says, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. So we talked about that, repenting from the one side and then going towards the other side, not just having one foot in and one foot out. We got to go all in. That all in is all in a living according to God in regard to the spirit. So we start to dig in to know more and more about the spirit. That's the only way we're going to draw closer to the father, as it says, in the mission statement, we got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So at least we know that the mission for this particular ministry, which is a Bible study group, that the mission is on point. What the word is saying that has to be our mission. Now it's all about making sure that we do it. We're not just paying God lip service. So I'm gonna go ahead and get going with this opening prayer. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you again for the clarity that you've allowed Peter to bring our way. And thank you for allowing us to see that Peter had to grow as we have said that we know we have to grow to help us to grow in our relationship with you, to learn more and more about you, to have the heart to seek you with all of our hearts, to understand that you are the treasure that your son is that stone called the jewel and it's in his name jesus christ that we pray amen Hallelujah. amen the game of all games is underway ready it is now time to play the recap game hope you guys are fired excited ready to go you've studied this you was with us last week you paid attention or you studied this on your own let us get going with Let's go, team. Let's go. question number one. Ready. What does God want everybody to be? Is it A, upset, 
be like-minded, C, discontent, or D, outrageous. What does God want everybody to be who says A, upset? All right, how about B, like-minded? B. 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 All right, and what about C, discontent? Okay, and who says D, outrageous? All right, the correct answer is be like-minded. We need to be like-minded. <laughs> so being like-minded is the goal. And we know that people are all over the place, all over the world, all over the place, just in one household. It looks like something that's impossible to be accomplished, but it's not impossible with the spirit because it's the word of God that created everybody. So it is possible. We just have to learn how to become one with the Holy Spirit and walk in accordance to it. That's taking effort and that's what we endeavor. So it is possible and God's gonna take that collective group that becomes like-minded in the word and bring everybody into that kingdom. We know what's gonna happen with everybody else. And so there will be that one group like mind it. Doesn't mean that that one group is from your one church. Like-minded by the spirit, it's the spirit, not just your collective group. So the spirit can bring like-minded that never even meet each other in person, but everybody be on the same page as it relates to the head of the church, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ recognizes who these people are throughout the world. They're going to be like-minded with Christ, even if they never met each other. That's important to know. All right. Question number two. What do we pay back others for evil? Is it A, a right across the lips, B, blessings, C, curses, or D, devotion? What do we pay back others for evil who says a right across the lips all right how about b blessings b b b okay who says c curses all right and what about d devotion all right the correct answer is b blessings we pay back others blessings for evil not evil for evil again we know this stuff is not easy and so we have to grow in our character mind and heart and that's only going to happen by being empowered by the holy spirit because if we go by who we've always been and who we are we know that this might be impossible right because there's some people that have done some crazy stuff to us and so just forgiveness is an issue in and of itself. Well, forgiveness is actually blessing. Wow, that's a big deal. All righty. Question number three. Jesus was put to death in the body, but made alive by what? Who says A, surgery, B, the spirit, C, wealth, or D, education. Jesus was put to death in the body, but made alive by what? Who says A, surgery? All right. What about B, the spirit? B. 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 Okay. Who says C, well? All right. And what about D, education? All right. The correct answer is B, the spirit. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the spirit. So if we're going to die to ourselves, die to the flesh being the master, then we got to be made alive by the spirit. So we need the spirit to be able to pull this off. Not a lot of people are talking about the spirit as it relates to the power to allow us to be able to do some things against our old self that's going to allow us to live while that old person die. That's a big deal. It's not about doing a ritual. You got to get the spirit. All right. Bonus question number four. How many people were saved during Noah's day? Is it A, 8, B, 12, 
C thousands or D millions. How many people were saved during Noah's day? Who says A eight? A. 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 All right. How about B twelve? Okay. Who says C thousands? All right. And what about D millions? All right. The correct answer is A eight. Eight is the total people saved during Noah's day. Hey, God says the road is narrow. Few find it. So it is not this whole big giant concept where it's all over the place that people are claiming. It, we don't know what that number is. It does say in heaven there was a numbers and numbers and more than numbers. And people can count on whatever God knows those numbers but he's saying that you got to deal with the reality based on the reality that not everybody is getting in. And so he's saying, since you don't know what exactly the number is, don't be taking everybody's word for stuff. You better dig in one and two. It's got to be urgent. So, hey, you know what I say? Your willingness to play this game and your heart to play the game tells me that. Y'all got game. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for playing the game. Really appreciate it. Fun, exciting, but serious business at the same time. You know what I say? Your willingness to play the game, because not everybody is willing, that we will get the right answers. If we get the wrong answers, it will help us build our convictions, and the objective is week over week to grow in our knowledge, grow in our convictions accomplish the wisdom that God has purposed for us and to get all of that into our hearts, our spirit, our soul, where we build conviction. Amen. So Amen. thank y'all for playing the game. It is now time to dig in. And again, we're studying Peter Chronicles book one, chapter four. We're going to continue in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 17 in the NIV. And we talked about prior how God is ready. And it says here, starting in verse 7, the end of all things is near. Rodney, that near is relevant. What does near really mean? Because this was written almost 2,000 years ago. So, you know, they were saying it was nearer then. Is it 2,000 years from now? Well, I can tell you this. We're reading this almost 2,000 years later. I can guarantee you that near is nearer today than it was 2,000 years ago. So <laughs> the urgency better be urgent because we don't know exactly what that near means. We just know it's nearer now than it was then, and they needed to have some urgency then. And so he says, the end of all things is near therefore. Be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. So be alert and of sober mind. So there's that mentality. We talked about the mentality that God is already ready, that Christ is ready. They're ready to roll, but we got to get ourselves ready. Can't have one foot in and one foot out. So he's going to be alert, be on the lookout. That's what alert means. Be awake, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. What are we praying for? We're praying for the situation because the end of all things is near. So we'll go ahead and do that study soon. We've studied some of it before, but if you just want to go ahead and go ahead and do that study on your own, well, just go check out the book of Revelation and start going toward the end of it. And it'll start describing some of the things that's going down. So, you know, you want to pray. In other words, there's things happening that require some serious prayer. And we don't want people not being able to make it. So we need people to become alert. That's one thing to pray for. I pray that the urgency of people getting their stuff together instead of being all on the wild, I pray that these people get serious and I pray that myself get serious. And so Holy Spirit, move us. Verse eight, above all, love each other deeply 
because love covers over a multitude of sins. So God is going, look here, I told you bless people when they do evil unto you. And so God is going, evil is even some crazy thoughts, negative thoughts about you. So he's saying, you telling me in your family that there's nobody ever that done something to you that have rubbed you the wrong way. There's nobody in your family that ever said something negative about you. There's nobody in your family that ever done any coarse joking about you. There's never anybody in your family that have doubted you, that have put you down. Well, yeah, those things have happened. So then you're supposed to love them regardless because love covers over a multitude of sins. So remember what I said in the beginning here. The concept of parent and child, the concept of family, God created. And so in this family dynamic, we are the ones who blew it in Genesis 3 in the garden, his creation. And then he comes and sends our brother here who happens to be God in the flesh of the Lord, full of the Holy Spirit. He has the full measure he comes here and his sacrifice of love covers over a multitude of sins. Every sin from the beginning to the end, alpha and omega. So again, he doesn't ask us to do anything that he does not do. And so how do we accept that from God? But then don't bring that forward to other people, not just in our family, but any other human being. So he's going, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. You go, why above all? Because he's going, because if he didn't do this, you don't have a shot. It's impossible. You're going to hell. So above all, that means that's the act that brought us back into a relationship with God. And without that relationship, there is nothing happening. You're gonna be jacked up for eternity. So that one act above all, you need to have the same mindset. What did he say? Arm ourselves with the same attitude of Christ. Verse nine, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You've been given a talent and a gift to serve other folks. It is not for you to lord over other folks. It's not for you to believe you better than everybody. It's not for you to be putting everybody down. It's not for you to be acting like you just just you you all that and and it's the clergy lady concept and hierarchy and all that goofiness no 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 there's gifts there's different gifts that recover different things that you can do that's different what somebody else can do but everybody is needed the i can't say to the foot i don't need you etc so each of you have received a gift that is to serve others i have the gift of breaking down scripture God gave me that when I didn't believe it. He called me to it. He fed me and continues to feed me game from his word. It is a gift I have that is obvious and I use it to serve other folks. That's why I don't just study by myself and not share it with anybody else. I put it out here on the channel. So anybody wants some, get some. So you should be doing the same thing, whatever gift God has given you. Verse 11 says, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. So he's going, okay, regardless of these gifts, because there's people with the gift to preach and teach, right? But regardless of that, you still should be speaking the very words of God. So you might not be eloquent, as Moses said. You might not have that gift of gab or whatever the case may be. You might not even have a real deep depth of insight. You haven't dug in like that. But he's requiring you to dig in enough that if your mouth is opening to speak, it's God speaking. That means that don't be speaking negative about anybody. In the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So don't be feeling these negative thoughts and letting your brain come up with these thoughts that's making your mouth speak out from this crazy heart that's negative about other folks. We got to get that stuff in check. 
So if anyone speaks, they should be doing so as the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. You can't get to the Father but through Jesus, and you're getting your gifts from the Father through Jesus. Jesus is the Word. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So that's the program and how it's set up. So if the head of the game, Jesus Christ, who has received the fullness of the Father, where glory and power is his forever and ever, amen, then it's him that came and sacrificed his life for all of us. It's him that came and served everybody. So he's the example that you follow. He used his gifts which ultimately had the gift of being obedient. And he used that for our benefit. And then every gift that he had, all these different talents, his ability to raise people from the dead, healing all these people, healing the sick, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind for the benefit of others. Because he wasn't blind, he wasn't sick, etc. Suffering for being a Christian. So he's back to... Okay, so with all that, here's this suffering concept again. And this is this, this is this suffering for following Jesus Christ. So dark forces, fallen entities are going to be on the attack they're in. Verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. So we talked about that before. We talked about it last week, how these thoughts and these words that people are doing, including their actions are all fiery darts. We know we got to have the shield of faith to do that. That means we have to keep our confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means he's above all those things. So faith is not just some stagnant concept that you believe. Faith gives us an ability to overcome and stand firm, to persevere through all this craziness without becoming crazy too, where we are now haters too. And so he's going, that test is to see if you're going to become a hater. And he goes, as though something strange were happening to you. Verse 13, but rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice that God deems us strong enough to go through this test, that Jesus went through them, he passed that test, and that we are going to pass that test because we're getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger because we're talking about it with each other, we're practicing it, we're fellowshipping one another based on these reality, not just showing up at a service, y'all hanging out, somebody went and preached, and then you over there talking about the football game and the basketball game, and you know me, I like athletic sport endeavor. But he's going, it's got to be deeper than that. You got to be talking about that real deal, holy field athletic level, which is battling against these dark forces and these depressed mindsets and distressed hearts and depressions and everything else and all kinds of other drama that's coming our way. Somebody saying you ain't no good, you're never going to be no good, you, never, you was never any good, etc. Rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, because they said the same thing about him. Oh, who is he talking about? He's God. He's a mere man talking about he was born before Abraham. This man ain't even 50 years old. Ain't nothing good that comes from Nazareth. Isn't his mom and his daddy and his brothers and sisters over here? Who does this guy think he is? All those darts. It says so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now, when God said, this is my son in whom I am well, please listen to him. And the other people heard it. Christ said, that wasn't for me, that was for y'all. I didn't need that for my confidence. Y'all needed it for your confidence. That was to help build your faith, but I'm good. I didn't need it. I don't let nobody talk this craziness, bring me down off of my throne. I know I'm a king. When the guy says, so you're a king then? He said, yes, you are right, I'm a king, but my kingdom is no longer of this world. But he didn't stop and say, no, I'm not a king. I guess I'm not a king because God allowed you to put me on the cross. And so that means I'm not a king because you're threatening to kill me. 
etc. So I guess I'm not really a king. I'm sorry I ever thought such a crazy thought. He ain't do none of that. He's like, you right in saying I'm a king. It didn't matter what was going down. He didn't have to have the trimmings of the world. He didn't have to have worldly success. He didn't have to have a mansion. He didn't have to ride the best horse. He rode a donkey and that was borrowed for him to say, I'm still all that. Verse 14, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So like the Holy Spirit rested upon Jesus when he came out of the baptism, it rested like a dove. He's going, the spirit of glory will rest on you the same way. So the spirit resting on us is how we know we're a family member. Remember, I talked about it. I'm like, the spirit is the game. We got to be digging deeper and deeper and deeper into the spirit, learning how to recognize it, knowing that it's on us. Like when you go to sleep at night and you put that blanket on because it's real cold, he's going, well, you got to wear that spirit like a blanket, except it don't come off, right? That's like a force field, shields up and they stay up. Verse 15, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. So you go, that's when he's saying, we got to get our stuff together. So he, he went first extreme, like uh, murderers and thieves and any other kind of criminal. And then he goes, or even a meddler. That means being in other people's business. Girl, you want to know what happened to them? Mm, let me tell you what went down with them yesterday. Stay out of folks' business and talking people's business where it is none of your business, right? Verse 16, however you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So if you're going to suffer anyway, you're going to suffer in the body, even if you can't even do the stuff you used to do. So verse 16 is going, A, if you suffer as a Christian, because in the body, you're going to suffer anyway, period. But you're not going to be given credit for that kind of suffering. But if you suffer for being a Christian, so if you're going to suffer for something, suffer for something that's going to count. So he goes, don't be ashamed of that. Praise God that you bear that name because people are going to be going, mm, look at that. So that's what they did with Jesus, right? They gambling for his garment, people spitting on him, saying, oh, he's a king. They put the crown of thorns on his head, mocking him, et cetera. God, go, people are going to mock you. Oh, that person, I thought they was all that. Look at them. They didn't become this. They didn't become that. They are not successful, et cetera. When you successful in Christ Jesus, you didn't poured out your heart to study his word and go within his realm and be connected to his spirit and die to this world. And people over there going, uh, I knew that person wasn't all that. They wasn't going to be nothing. And God's going, yeah, praise God that you bear the name because you suffering that type of attack because you're a Christian. But this is for even if people don't even know the spirits behind the scene know, and there's going to be drama coming your way, period. And so you're going to suffer for being a Christian, period, whether you say you won or not. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. Whoa, in my father's house are many rooms. But before you can get there, you're going to have to go through a process. You're going to have to get the ID check, et cetera. So he's going, it's time for judgment to begin with God's household. That means those of the church. That judgment is going to begin there. You are not just home free because you got baptized and you showing up to a service or two. That the heart, the mind, the dying to the old self, the living for righteousness, being connected to the Holy Spirit, digging in, keeping in step with it, et cetera. Like you got to be all in the game. And if it begins with us, it says, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? He's going, this is based on obeying the gospel of God. Well, we know that we need grace and mercy. We know we need that by faith so that we can make it 
because the gospel of God is something that we're not fully obeying or else we would not need the grace and mercy and Jesus wouldn't have had to come here and die on the cross. But because he did, then that judgment is going to be based on that faith and that faith is going to say, you got the grace to get it going, get it together, get your act in order. So grace don't mean, oh, I got grace, my sins are not counted against me so I can just chill out. No, it means I got the grace to get my act together because they are already ready. So grace means I'm not wasting time. I'm urgent. Well, judgment's going to begin to see how urgent were you. Uh. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 18 and 19, and we'll conclude it here. Again, we're studying the Peter Chronicles, book one, chapter four. And it's breaking news, right? The news that Jesus provided the way that he and the father are ready. The angels are ready to come do their thing. They all geared up. They got the armament going. He's going, you guys put your armament on. And that armament is to arm ourselves with the same mindset, the attitude of Jesus Christ. And so now we should be getting ready. Verse 18, and... If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Oh, so you mean it's not easy to be saved? No. Everything that we just read is not easy. So that's going to take some serious digging in, some serious character, some serious fortitude, some serious perseverance, some serious desire to want to win and do this thing right. This is athletic on steroids. It's an athlete of the mind. It's an athlete of the heart. It's an athlete of the call. This is not for the faint of heart. This is no joke. Verse 19, so then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So not good and evil, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil in the garden, not that, continue to do good moving forward. We got to continue moving forward and continue to grow in that urgency. That means we got to continue to dig in and know more and more about the truth because the truth will set us free from the deception and the result will be an urgent heart. And so that when God sends Jesus Christ back, we will be ready because he is already ready. He's ready for us to take that grace, not flounder it, but use it to get our stuff together. Alrighty, so hey, you know what we say. We are either reigning as priests or we are not, says the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, as it says in Revelation 1, 6, has made us to a kingdom priest. We serve our God and reign on the earth. It says in 1 Peter 2, 9, he has made us into a royal priesthood, as a priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, who has no beginning and no end. Jesus Christ is that high priest forever. We're in that priesthood. That's what makes us a royal priesthood because we are priesthood in the priesthood of the king and priest of Salem, which is peace. And that is why we say peace in. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much for again for giving us clarity into your word as, as best as I can break it down. So we pray that we are able to take what's being said and get our hearts moved. It's all about the conviction. It's all about giving us the heart to get our stuff together and get urgent to get our, our bags packed correctly on a spiritual level and to understand that there's life beyond this planet. And so we gotta be ready for that. We thank you for your son being the example, showing us the truth of that reality and that he went before us and he'd come to your home and prepare a room for us. And we know that's no joke. Help us every day to continue to be reminded of that truth, to grow in that reality and to make it urgent upon our minds and upon our hearts. We thank you so much for your son and his sacrifice and his clarity and reality of grace and truth and faith. It's in his name, Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
All right, everybody. So, hey, thank you again for studying. We、we'll、continue with the study. I hope you greatly appreciate the study. And until the next time, I want to tell you, peace in. Bye, everybody. We love you. Peace in and love.